you were a fantastic cricket player you were doing absolutely well and you represented the state of karnataka at the junior national level and you're passionate about sports why didn't you pursue a career in sports yeah, first of all i don't know if i was fantastic i was definitely enthusiastic uh, but uh, the the thing uh, was that i came up against a very significant choice quite early on so um, while i was uh, at college i was still playing quite serious cricket uh, but i also went ahead and did the nls uh, entrance test and i didn't study very hard for it i just th- thought i did it on a bit of a lark and i got in actually uh, to my surprise and perhaps the surprise of a few other people and at that uh, interview uh, we had the founder director dr madhav menon and he still uh, sort of his words ring in my head of so young man are you going to be a cricketer or a lawyer because you're not going to be both of them so yeah. i think that was a very pivotal point uh, it wasn't really my decision if uh, given a chance i would have probably tried to be a lawyer and a cricketer but i came to this fork in the road and i i personally made that decision to become a lawyer so i uh, am now an enthusiastic lawyer in the same way i was an enthusiastic cricketer yeah and how did sports define your five years at law school yeah you know palavi a uh, sport like like i said i had to make this choice quite early on I was 17 18 still playing quite serious cricket um and it felt uh, like a pretty easy choice at the time but i think as i went along i realized that given up something quite uh, meaningful and important to me um and i just felt while i was in law school i had to make that count you given up something significant uh, with what you the opportunity cost you have to make that meaningful and yeah. the thing is uh, i mean the, the passion was there to do things well i think sport gives you that Uh, but it also gives you these tools you know to look at a destination and then piece together a path to get there so in many ways i played the law school game a little bit like a sport uh, if you can call it that so to see where you had to get to do the things necessary and uh, i think in the modern day it's called hustle but i think at that point it's about being smart about how to approach a goal and then uh, sort of use all your resources uh, well and i think uh bringing that sporting approach was quite meaningful to me and uh, in doing quite well through law school uh, setting goals for myself and then achieving them so uh, perhaps uh, it's, it's not a, a normal way to go through law school but that's what a sports person does yeah and i think it worked well with you getting the road scholar and then going to harvard later yeah i mean it looked like uh, some of the rewards were uh, came many times over from playing sport and i mean the road scholarship when i applied for it it was certainly helpful to have played cricket at a good level because it was looking for people who had multiple interests and multiple uh, sort of dimensions so yeah being a lawyer cricketer made a difference <laughs> and your book i have it right in front of me how did boundary lab happen yeah you know for me over the years uh, i'm i would call myself a lawyer first but uh, even more than that i would call myself someone really deeply interested in sport and its various intersections with the law with society with commerce uh, so all of those things are little bits i've been curious about thought about and then over the years started working on so i uh, practice a lot of uh, my my legal practice involves working with sports bodies sports organizations uh, sports businesses athletes so i've seen this from various different dimensions i've worked with the government on drafting policy uh, i've worked with athletes so really uh, the book was an amalgamation of my ideas and thoughts a uh, fair bit of my practical experiences but more than that a little bit of a vision for what i think uh, the role of sport in society is and uh, i would say it's a unique lens my my vantage point as a lawyer as someone who's also played sport now as a parent of young kids trying to play sport uh, so all of these put together i felt i had a unique voice Uh, and i wanted to express it um, it was convenient to have uh, the the access i've had to various different perspectives as a lawyer so bringing that together it just felt like a book that needed to be written at a particular time uh, i somehow made the bandwidth for it and uh, put words my my ideas into words and i think it's been a very interesting journey because it just helped me also clarify a lot of my thoughts because until you write stuff down a lot of this remains unformed and it remains very sort of uh, i would say in the ether these ambiguous thoughts but the minute yeah. you put down words sentences paragraphs you have to concretize those thoughts so it's a very meaningful process of uh, clarity i would say for myself 
And I really like the way you have structured the book. It starts with a very interesting question and it really piques uh, readers' interest and you want to get to the answer. So, and the way you take us through that chapter, it's very interesting. No, thank you, Bhavi. I, I think I, I did spend a lot of time because I, what I wanted this to be is a book for anyone. It's not a sports law book. It's not a sports book. It's not a law book. Uh, whatever place you find yourself in, I was hoping to be uh, able to provide some insight or uh, sort of feed a curiosity um, and just help people on a journey to understand how many, many different things interconnect. So I'd say for someone who loves sport, it uh, brings you a dimension of the law. For someone who uh, is working in the law, I think sport gives you a new dimension to the way you think about the law and regulation. And if neither sport nor law is interesting to you, still there's something for you in terms of understanding the role of the public domain, the role of regulation, and all of our roles in the bigger picture, I would say. Interesting. So uh, you have both the dimensions, sports and law. So Nandan, do you think is litigation a sport? And yes or no, why or why not? No, it's a great question. I have I don't play that uh, that sport, but uh, you could call it uh, in some sense uh, certainly an adversarial, not that dissimilar from sport, right? You have some uh, prize at the end. Uh, you you are both uh, on both sides or multiple sides playing these roles. So there's certainly players, and like they say, all the world's a stage, and all of us are players. And certainly in litigation, it seems like this. There's, there's a big prize at the end, and everyone's working towards it. So it certainly has the dimensions of sport. It would not fall. My chapter one is what is the definition of sport? If you're being very technical, uh, perhaps wouldn't fall into the, the strict definition, but certainly has many of the elements of entertainment, some rules to play by, and certainly some of the grandstanding that uh, that sport offers. So I can see some parallels and I can see where that question is coming from. Okay. But in your definition of sports, it is not. Uh, in your book. No, it pro probably wouldn't meet the, the standard there. Interesting. And uh, one thing I found very interesting, you speak about doping and you mentioned that India is number one in doping in the world. So what is the issue with doping or why is doping so bad? Uh, why can't like athletes, tennis players, they all have specific diets that they need to follow. So when it comes to supplements that sports people can take, why can't they be allowed to take those if they disclose all of that? Yeah, so it's a very uh, topical question, in fact, Bhavi. So there's there's this whole new games that have been set up, uh, venture-funded, what, what's called the enhanced games. And they want to allow you to dope as much as you want. So it's a competition of uh, fully disclosed, you can do whatever you want. But to answer the most specific question of why does organized sport in its current form not accept doping? So what is the purpose? And the, the, the book is called Boundary Lab, right? This, this laboratory that we're putting all of our athletes in. What is it that we're testing? In many ways, we're testing human capabilities. We're actually not testing, uh, I would say, uh, adapted human capabilities. Uh, all of the athletes that are playing in, in high performance sport are representing all of us as a species, trying to test the boundaries of what it's like to be on, I would, what you would call a normal human. And I don't think uh, the average human consumes chemicals to uh, sort of perform at a higher level. Uh, there's an element of disingenuity to be uh, consuming chemical substances. Lots of athletes take natural uh, supplements and many other like protein supplements, which are all legal. But where doping comes into the picture is where there's performance enhancing substances and performance enhancing uh, sort of processes like, for example, blood doping, where you actually re uh, sort of uh, uh, taking a transplant of, uh, sorry, a transfusion of blood that has been uh, created at much higher uh, altitudes. So these are not natural ways of doing, but there's also a health element. So uh, in, in fact, taking a lot of these doping substances has been scientifically proved to actually reduce lifespan. We've seen many athletes actually die reasonably young uh, when uh, doping's been involved. Uh, it is not a healthy way to live. So th there's an element of health, but there's also an element of uh, it, it just being genuine, is there a genuine element of representation of the species and playing the sport in the way that any of us could without uh, sort of having to rely on what you would call unnatural measures and means? Uh, I mean, you could argue that that's also part of human innovation, right? La laboratories should be encouraged to build chemical substances to improve the human performance. 
but it's a debatable one and one that's coming into the uh, sort of the headlights with these enhanced games so it's going to be an interesting debate uh, quite a topical one that you brought up yeah uh, ipl season is anyway on and if you think ipl is a qualified success while we have seen other leagues not hit it off the way ipl has so what are the three things you would recommend taking from ipl for other leagues which will make it work or just the best three things from ipl that other leagues could take yeah so uh, i think one of the chapters actually addresses that of why did, why has the ipl worked while many of the other leagues haven't and one of my premises is that you shouldn't be trying to borrow from the ipl in fact each sport needs to find its own space its own voice and its own uh, sort of little uh, way of doing things not every sport is ready for a league some might need tournaments ipl is 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 a product that is built on a very successful product which was cricket already so by the time the ipl came in in 2008 uh, cricket had a very significant following already so yeah. this franchise model of the ipl bringing private participants in getting them to invest there was a very clear pathway to uh, how uh, money could be made by everyone so yeah. it wasn't uh, the franchises were not investing in trying to build a new audience it was in, in some sense in uh, capturing the audience's imagination in a new way and in the bargain many more people came to the sport so what ipl has been very successful at has been democratizing i would say uh, decision making in bringing in these 10 franchises so it's no longer just one body that's making all the decisions but selection decisions uh, sort of identifying talent all of that has got democratized but it's all sitting on a very successful domestic structure of ranji trophy thousands of matches being held all over so you can't take learnings from one sport and try and transpose them on another sport which is still far from actually having a domestic structure but i think what the the there's clarity on is that it it needs a strong uh, centralized system where there is a, 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 a federation like the bcci that has vision direction and ambition and that all of the other people are uh, good support staff like i mean support actors like the franchises who are going to in some sense build together but i, I think the the obvious one is how uh, uh, legally structurally financially strong the bcci is at the at the center so it actually did not need the ipl but it was able to successfully pull off the ipl but because it was already a successful body yeah. so i would say uh, a, a strong leadership uh, to uh, an imagination to bring more private capital in on well regulated terms okay. and i think just making uh, a high level of uh, uh, i would say a mix between sport and entertainment accessible to new audiences like if you go into the average ipl match the number of women the number of kids uh, coming to watch is is incredible but also the way it has been uh, access to the content has been democratized through free viewership uh, using online media like during ipl season you go out anywhere at every shop uh, there's a maybe a driver waiting for someone in a car everyone is watching so the the access barrier to even participate in some way shape or form even if you don't get a ticket into the stadium is all there so it's really become a much larger community event and captured the imagination And I think there are sort of some direct and some indirect learnings for other sports as well from that. It's interesting. And uh, you, uh, since we're talking about cricket, and you've played uh, both cricket and hockey seriously, why has cricket exploded the way it has? While we were as national teams really good at both cricket and hockey, why has cricket exploded the way it has, and why? hockey hasn't and what explains the disparity between the two yeah so it's a, it's a great question because i mean my first sport was hockey i love the sport it's a fabulous team sport to play uh, cricket in fact is quite different from hockey it's very much an indica it's an individual sport but played in a team environment at any point of time it's really one one on one but there are yeah. other support actors but if you look at the trajectory of these two sports in india they actually go across each other right as as hockey is waning um 1980 is the last time we win a, a olympic medal and you see 1983 is the big event where we win the cricket world cup so in fact there is a point at which they they intersect and then cricket takes off and uh, hockey has its in some sense uh, decline and a steady decline and there are many different reasons for that so one i think we uh, sport is highly driven by notions of success 
1983, then we won the 1985 uh, trophy in Australia. And then soon after that was the emergence of a legend like Tendulkar, right? So he carried uh, cricket through even while India did not do that well. Um, so that uh, there's there's uh, victories and then there's icons. Uh, through that period, actually, uh, India lost uh, a lot on the, I would say, the governance of hockey. Uh, hockey moved from uh, being played on sort of natural surfaces to artificial surfaces. Um, in that same period, uh, perhaps more recently, the BCCI has become much more powerful in global governance. So you see, uh, as one grows, the other declines in uh, public popularity, commercial relevance, but also India's place in the world. And the reality is that performance in sport is a knock-on of how uh, things are governed, uh, the amount of money there is, how much can be spread down to the grassroots. So these are all interconnected things. And the more people watch, the more interest there is, the better the commercial model, which flows down uh, right through the sport. So I'd say just that 1983 win, uh, the emergence of Tendulkar, and then obviously more recently, the emergence of uh, things like the IPL, where uh, sport has been professionalized and hundreds of young people get careers from sport. Uh, that has not happened yet in hockey in, in the same way. I think hockey is still uh, subject to some level of state patronage. The BCCI actually gets no funds from the government. It's independent yeah. of the sources of its funding. Uh, through sponsorships, broadcast rights, and others, while hockey is still dependent on government uh, grants, uh, the Odisha government supports the hockey team. Um, there, there isn't really a commercial model, and it, it's not like there are hundreds of kids lining up to make careers in hockey. Um, yeah, I think all of those things interconnect. Uh, and when you talk about regulation and sports governance, should uh... Do you think sports regulation and sports governance should be further sealed off from broader governance? Basically, if government doesn't participate at all and it's just completely given to private bodies. Yeah, so this is uh, actually probably one of the hottest debates on and it's actually in the courts, right? So you see yeah. so many times now the courts intervening in national sports federations because of the lack of governance. What is deemed to be inadequate governance in compliance with uh, the regulations set by uh, the state, which is the National Sports Development Code. So you constantly see uh, judiciary intervening and uh, uh, sort of appointing ad hoc bodies, com uh, committees of administrators, trying to reformulate those bodies. Now, in, in return, what the government is also saying is if things are so bad, why shouldn't we try and make things better through not just active regulation, but uh, in some sense, flood the bodies with the uh, competent people as well. So it's a little bit of a double bind we're in, right? So uh, is uh, governance of sport important? It is probably the, the single most important thing that's going to transform the, uh, I would say, the, 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 the scale of achievement and how the industry is going to grow, how careers are going to be made. Is there adequate attention being spent on them, uh, sort of getting the best governors in? Um, I, I don't think the answer is uh, yes so far. So there's all of these disparate efforts taking place by the judiciary, by the government, uh, from within the bodies themselves. So the, the, the thing with sport is that there's a very unique concept of, of autonomy. So the whole uh, sports movement is supposed to be an autonomous movement that is actually immune from government intervention and interference. Now, that, that interference is an interesting term because does it mean that there's no accountability as well? Because in reality, all of these sports bodies are little monopolies because they actually control the, uh, the whole sport, including any potential of playing it professionally, representing the country. So would you regulate it through uh, government regulation? Would you regulate it through competition regulation? Is, is competition law the right thing to look at? So there's all of these various things going on. And People are just sitting and saying, okay, if this is not going to be governed, what is my role in bringing about reform and change? So in some sense, everyone has thrown the hat into the ring because it is such a significant inflection point in the, the future of, of Indian sport. And I, I, there is a feeling that so far the government has let it be because a lot of these bodies are heavily politicized. So there was no real incentive to actually depoliticize them because if you're asking members of parliament to regulate bodies where members of parliament are sort of controlling the bodies. It's it's a bit of a, a challenge to get that through. And we've seen that where even the cabinet has even rejected, uh, I think in 2013, 
the National Sports Development Bill when it had actually come to a significant maturity. So yeah. at some point, if you're seeing this as uh, no one's going to do anything, this is the breach into which the judiciary has really stepped in. And I would say the judiciary has been very, very activist in particular over the last five, six years. Uh, I mean, the uh, broader questions are, should the judiciary be regulating these sports bodies? Um, difficult one to answer, but uh, perhaps the judiciary is saying, if no one else is going to do it, we'll do it because there is a public interest involved. A uh, very important doctrine has evolved from the judiciary where while these are acknowledged as autonomous private bodies, they are also designated as performing public functions. Yeah. So they become amenable to the jurisdiction, uh, to sort of the court's uh, jurisdiction. And this is a very significant development uh, across the board and with learnings for lots of other autonomous bodies as well. Uh, you, I think, have taken me to my next question, which was judicial intervention or courts uh, hearing sports matters. So do you think should judicial decision making in sports matters in India be restricted to specialized sports tribunals? Should we take away all the sports cases from Indian courts to a specialized tribunal like IOC tribunal or whatever you would recommend? Yes. This is a, I mean, a significant issue because when you uh, look back on the last six, seven years, we're finding that lots of these national sports federations are spending huge amounts of their budget actually on litigation, yeah. on, on lawyers, on cases, uh, and just sort of, in some sense, defending positions. So actually, both administrative time and finance is being spent in the courts of India, which would otherwise possibly have gone into sports development, right? A lot of these are government-funded bodies. So they all receive government grants. Uh, I mean, a significant portion of those grants is going towards lawyer fees. And perhaps that's not an ideal place for us to, to look at. I think tribunals are important uh, to, to be specialized uh, and to understand how sport works, what the interests are, and to, to mediate. Uh, the UK has built some very uh, effective alternate dispute resolution mechanisms like sports resolutions. Uh, obviously, there's CAS, which has its own tribunal. But for me, even before getting into disputes, I feel we need a, a much stronger and clearer regulatory structure. And the thing that I've advocated sometimes in the past is just like public uh, companies have SEBI um, with listing guidelines, perhaps it's time to have a sports regulator, an independent sports regulator with uh, almost listing guidelines for these monopoly bodies that are, are regulatory in nature. So even before disputes come up, there's a very clear structure in place to uh, keep people on track, to keep bodies working in the way they're meant to. Because when you're a monopoly, uh, inaction is as bad as uh, maladministration, right? Because if, if you don't act, not something, nothing happens. Um, and I think it's time for that uh, if we take a more mature view of the way bodies have to work. Because right now, the government, because of the autonomy issue, is in single mode. It only has two choices, to either de-recognize the body or to recognize the body. So yeah. it has this laundry list of things in the National Sports Development Board. And it says, if you meet them, we will recognize you. If you don't meet them, we will de-recognize you. So there's very little granular uh, sort of management and oversight of these bodies. They're meant to do it democratically within and by themselves. But that somehow hasn't worked over the years for various reasons. Do you think lawyers make a good sports agent? Yeah, it's, it's an area and a profession that hasn't been fully developed in India because a lot of uh, the bodies in India do not recognize either sports agents or sports unions. Uh, so there's very little role an intermediary negotiator actually has in India. Sports agents have been very successful and important players, obviously, in European football, in the transfer market. Uh, in the US, most sport, a large number of sports agents are actually law, legally trained because a lot of it is in contract negotiation, in uh, sort of collective bargaining agreements, but also how the player interacts with their club, um, things like image rights, publicity rights. We actually don't have that level of maturity because many of the, the relationships are directly between athlete and club. We have a, a, a very early, I would say, emerging agent ecosystem in Indian football. In cricket, there isn't really that much of a role for agents in the, the dealings within the sport because uh, for example, in the IPL, players just get into the auction and get picked up. There's no real negotiation of value. It's not like you can have a separate contract. But where agents have played a role is really in the endorsement market. But that isn't really sports agency. That 
the the role is quite similar to managing a bollywood actor actor or actress so the sports agents have had limited role but i think over time there is a room for lawyers young lawyers to uh, sort of play in this space uh, but at a much larger level i'm quite optimistic of the role for lawyers in indian sport so uh, the, the next phase is going to be a very regulated environment so where these bodies uh, depend on good documentation depend on regulations good governance structures and i think uh, young lawyers in india are being increasingly well trained to to uh, both uh, write speak document and structure things uh, in uh, governance structure so I, I do think there is an increasing role for lawyers in 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 a in a structured institution like sport okay and do you think is sporting success in uh, india geographically uneven and do you see the future as being darkly driven by cities that's a, it's a great question i uh, i don't know if you can call it uneven but you can certainly call it anecdotal like you really don't know where the next person is going to come from it's not like we've really built these nurseries where you know you're going to produce the next shooter from x state or i mean maybe wrestling is one example of where the akras in uh, haryana have really produced many a large uh, line yeah. of champions maybe there are a few other sports where uh, athletes emerge from certain places like cricket has produced many from mumbai some from karnataka but i think that the indian cricket team is a fabulous example of the de- democratization of talent and we're seeing that across the various sports as well uh, the i'd say 20 years ago and when i was playing cricket um you would see one or two or three players out of 15 from the districts in a state team or even the national team so most were from large cities kolkata bangalore uh, delhi uh, mumbai but now you look at the team and many call it the dhoni effect of uh, the belief and imagination that anyone can make it and you see m- many many uh, people in the indian 15 are uh, from smaller towns tier 2 cities even tier 3 cities coming from humble beginnings and actually making the way through and i think that just shows that talent can land anywhere you don't choose and i don't choose where talent lands it's do you have the structures in place to to identify that talent and the pathways to take that talent up towards uh, elite success and uh, it is a, a strong indication of success if you have whether it's formal or informal structures to know when someone is outrageously talented and to bring them into the the formal um, sort of uh, funnel of sport okay um uh, you mentioned dhoni so i'm going to uh, take you to your chapter 9 where you say should dhoni own the helicopter shot yes. and can he get the ip protection for his helicopter shot you i think you say no if yeah, i'm not i'm not giving away any answers here okay. <laughs> no but i think the, the this was a very interesting chapter to me and actually one of the ones that i love the most because i actually studied a lot of ip I, before i did work in sport I, i've been doing a lot of stuff in ip and information technology and really getting into the theory of why intellectual property as a system exists at all and then overlaying that onto sport so the, the simple question i ask is what is it that makes people innovate and create and for the longest time we've been told that the intellectual property system is the only reason or the primary reason why people are innovative or creative is because they're going to make some money off it through the exclusivity or give it and that if you don't give it people are not going to innovate and create so the this was a really an exploration of how people innovate and create within sport what incentives they get as a result and whether you need intellectual property within sport and if you don't need it in within sport are there other little ecosystems where you actually don't need it in the same way that you don't need it in sport um so it, it was a quite quite a unique chapter in that sense looking at that but looking at other sports as well and the, the unique things people do and many of them do it without any uh, objective or motive other than trying to get better right and uh, maybe that there are learnings from that for uh, the world at large that people create good things not just uh with the uh, financial incentives or control in mind but there is some element of just wanting to take uh, humanity forward and uh, do your bit and to be remembered perhaps and we'll probably remember dhoni even 50 years from now for playing helicopter Absolutely. and maybe that's enough right maybe that's enough for dhoni the legacy that he leaves not that he is making enough money as well so <laughs> but it's not from ip so. yeah so i think everyone has to read the book to get the answer yeah, exactly 
And I think you've answered the first part of my next question, which is your most favorite chapter in the book and which one was the most difficult chapter to write? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Dhoni one was fun. There are a few other chapters which are also uh, quite interesting. The uh, one that uh, was tough to write was the one on gender. So there's actually a chapter and it's perhaps the most detailed one on the way uh, sport deals with the gender binary. Uh, I'm not a gender specialist, but I certainly have been very, very interested in the development of both men's sport and women's sport. But at a time when you're dealing with uh, this fluidity of gender and then trying to bring some sense to it in a sport where it's very clearly binary, right? It's male sport and female sport. And just finding that uh, the battle that is ongoing and just recognizing all the challenges that come up and uh, I don't think there is a right answer and to just accept that sometimes we're not going to find answers to difficult questions, but you still have to address them. You still have to uh, allow the battles to happen. Uh, inclusion, fairness, these are all terms that we have in our minds, but in a very concrete uh, instance, when they come head to head, uh, it can be extremely challenging. So that, that was a, a tough chapter and it's a very tough issue. Uh, yeah. But it's also an issue which really talks about why this book exists, which is my belief is that sport is very often on the front lines of some of these very difficult battles. Uh, yeah. Very often we treat sport as very marginal. Oh, this happened on the play field. This is the way this body was governed. And there's an element of being switched off from sport and that it's a sort of a marginal curiosity in our lives. But in things like gender, and it really comes home in the, in the issue of gender, there's no other place where this battle is being fought so hard as it is in gender with respect to people with their different chromosomal structures, with people who are transitioning genders. So all of this is coming to a head. And the, the reality is if we are not participating in that, we are actually opting out from one of the largest sort of social challenges of our times is, is the definition of gender. And if you're not in the debate, you're going to be excluded from the discussion. And that is why I feel we, all of us have to give a little bit more attention to what's happening in sport. We should care about the, the battles being fought in sport and how they're resolved and that fair processes are being undertaken. That There is no right result, but I think there is fair process. And my one last question to you is, who is your favorite sports person? Oh, that's a, that's a tough, uh, tough question. I mean, I have many favorites. I uh, work closely with a number of sports people. Uh, I mean, one I work closely with is Rahul Dravid. He's someone I uh, was my senior in school, senior in college, and uh, had very similar journeys So someone I looked up to. Um, I just find someone like that uh, of very high integrity, but also humility. And uh, it's just wonderful to see uh, a whole range of sports people. Though. And I, I, I think there is no one model of a, sp a sports person. And that's the beauty of sport, right? That uh, it actually is so universal that there's room for every type of person. You could be humble, you could be, uh, you could be, very loud, but there's space for you and it'll, it'll give you an opportunity to uh, to participate. And that universality of sport is its most important element. And I think there is space for all of us, there's space for all of us to contribute. And sport is a beautiful thing because it gives you back uh, value for everything you put in. You may not be able to choose what value it gives back. Uh, sport chooses that, but it almost inevitably gives you feedback when you, you invest in it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Balvi. Lovely speaking with you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon.